Chapter 2, Section 4. This is about scientific revolutions. And specifically, it's really about how evolutionary theory changed the way we do science forever. Scientific revolutions have changed how we perceive the universe. They have also changed how we perceive our place in the universe as well. Now always remember, the very beginning of science is with people making observations and asking questions. And of course, there's my wife. She's making an observation of a bird or the Golden Gate Bridge. And I'm observing my wife. One of the biggest changes in the way we view ourselves in the universe is realizing the Earth was round, that it was not flat, and that it was not the center of the universe. Today, we clearly know we are not the center of the universe. In 1977, NASA launched the Voyager space probe. It was a probe to go out and photograph the outer planets. Carl Sagan was involved with this, and he had them turn the probe around and take a picture of the Earth against the vastness of the cosmos. And as you can see, there is the Earth. It is a pale blue dot, a speck amongst the vastnesses of the universe. Now think about it. 4.6 billion years of our planet's history is right there, including the entirety of humanity. Every king that's ever ruled, every war that's ever been fought, every person that's ever fallen in love, every test you ever aced, all of that has occurred right there on our planet. Copernicus was one of the first to realize the Earth was not the center of the universe. And he did this by making careful observations of the planets, the moon, and the sun, and he realized we all revolve around the sun, not everything revolving around the Earth. And that was quite revolutionary for the time. Newton, he also revolutionized science. And the way he did it, he was able to take the laws of motion and gravity and describe them mathematically. So he gave us our first laws of nature. Then along comes Einstein. Einstein developed the special theory of relativity in 1905. This was also groundbreaking. In this theory, he showed that energy is equivalent to mass times the velocity of the light, speed of light squared. Now think about that. The speed of light is 186,282 miles per second. That is fast enough to travel around the world seven times in one second. What he realized with E equals mc squared is that there is an enormous amount of energy tied up in matter. And in fact, it ushered in the nuclear age. In 1945, we blew up the first atomic bomb at the Trinity site here in New Mexico, unleashing an enormous amount of energy. What you're watching right now is a mushroom cloud of an exploding atomic bomb in the 1950s. These bombs are devastatingly powerful. And what's amazing is that all this destructive power right here, there is only about one gram of matter being converted to energy. That was amazing. So Einstein revolutionized the world. He did it again. In 1915, Einstein published the General Theory of Relativity. Now, Newton came up with a law of gravity, but he didn't explain how gravity works. Einstein explained it with his General Theory of Relativity. And what he showed was that objects of mass warp space-time. So what you're seeing on this picture, imagine that's the sun and it's warping space around it. Now, you and I, we're three-dimensional beings. We have length width, and height. We don't really recognize a fourth dimension. It's beyond our comprehension. But you can imagine being two-dimensional, length and width. So if you have length and width, you have no concept of height. So if you bend a piece of paper and you're a two-dimensional being, you have no concept of that bend. So we have no concept of the bend of space. We can't visualize it. But we can actually test for it and measure it. And in fact, in the late 1919, I think, they actually tested the fact that the sun bent space-time around it by looking at an eclipse. 
and they verified his theory and it was revolutionary. It's so far ahead of its time that it actually predicted an expanding universe before there was any evidence of it. He predicted black holes and gravity waves. All of these things we have very good evidence for today. Darwin in 1859 also revolutionized the world of science by publishing his book on the origin of species. So he proposed a theory of evolution by natural selection. Ever since Darwin has published his theory of evolution by natural selection, it has become biology's central paradigm. It makes sense. And the reason why it's our central paradigm is because evolution explains why there's a great diversity in life. And you're looking at a bay scallop, you're looking at in the middle those are mosses, and a beetle on the right. Incredible diversity in life. However, there is also unity in life. What you're looking at here is a forelimb of a human, that's our arm, a dog, a bird wing, and a whale fin. Very different animals, but yet we're all tetrapods, which means tetra for pod means foot. And what you see there, we have the same bones. All of us, all mammals, we have the same bones. We have the humerus, that's that bone at the top. The two smaller bones next to them are the radius and the ulna. Then we have carpals, metacarpals, and phalanges. Why do we all have the same bones? Well, we evolved from an ancestor that had those bones, and over time they become modified into an arm, a leg, a wing, or a fin. So evolution explained the unity and diversity of life. Just to reiterate, Evolution is biology's central paradigm because Darwin's theory of evolution by natural selection explained the unity and diversity of life. There are actually other scientists who came up with evolution by natural selection, including Alfred Russell Wallace. However, Darwin is credited with being the first scientist to fully develop the theory of evolution by natural selection. And the nice thing is when uh, Alfred Russell Wallace, or A.R. Wallace, came up with the theory, he actually sent it to Darwin, and Darwin presented both of them to the Royal Academy. However, Darwin had a clear paper trail going back years, and everybody knew that Darwin had been working on it. He actually wasn't going to publish his theory of evolution until after he died, but when Wallace gave him his manuscript, Darwin realized he was going to be scooped, so he went ahead and published his Origin of Species the following year. And now for a history lesson. I want to show you the events that led to Darwin developing his theory of evolution by natural selection. You know, it often seems like people just come up with these theories out of the blue, and that's not the case at all. They're influenced by other people, and in fact we say they build on the shoulders of giants. And that's a quote from Newton, actually. Okay, so there were lots of people who influenced Darwin, and I'm not going to go over all of them, but just a couple of them here. One of them was this guy named Charles Lyell, who wrote The Principles of Geology, and he gave this book to Darwin. So Darwin didn't have many possessions when he was traveling on the Beagle, but he did have The Principles of Geology. And this book was very important for one reason. Well, probably more than one reason. But he promoted uniformitarianism. I know that's a big word, but look at just uniform. Uniform means the same. So Lyell was trying to understand geological processes. And to understand the past, he realized we need to know the present. So he said, hey, the processes of mountain building and erosion that operate today operate the same in the past, and they will operate the same in the future, and they will operate the same anywhere. Hence the name uniformitarianism. Now the implication of this was that the earth was old. And this is a big break from what people normally thought at the time. At the time, people thought the Earth was just a few thousands of years old because they had no real reason to think it was any older. But the reality is, the Earth was old. And that's important, and we're going to come back to that in a few minutes. Another person who influenced Darwin was Malthus. And Malthus wrote about exponential population growth. You see, about the early 1800s, humans, for the first time, reached a billion people. And what Malthus was saying was that any population is capable of exponential growth. Now exponential growth is one, two, 
4, 8, 16, 32, 64, 128, 256, 512, 1,000, 2,000. You get the idea. It just keeps growing faster and faster and faster. So to give you another example of exponential population growth, I could take a pair of fruit flies, breed them in January, take all their offspring, breed them, do that all the way up until about the end of the summer, and the earth would be covered in fruit flies about a meter thick. But we're clearly not covered in fruit flies, so even though populations are capable of, expo of exponential growth, they typically don't do it. That is also an important piece of the puzzle. And this guy, John Stevens Henslow, he's the one that recommended Darwin as a ship's naturalist. See, in 1859, or sorry, 1831, Darwin was a young man. He was like 22 years old. He didn't really know what he was going to do with his life. And uh, Henslow here recommended that Darwin be a ship's naturalist because he was of the right social standing. And he was also very good at making collections. I don't know if anybody in here is a birder, but... There's a Henslow Sparrow that John James Audubon named after John Stevens Henslow. So here it is, 1831, Charles Darwin was only in his early 20s. He was born in 1809, February 12th, the same day as Abraham Lincoln, to say. Well, at any rate, um, Darwin was not really knowing what he was going to do in his life. He wasn't going to be a doctor. He couldn't handle it. He tried seminary school. But he did like to go out and make collections, and that's why Henslow recommended him to be the ship's naturalist. Now, the HMS Beagle left on December 27th, 1831. They were supposed to leave on the 26th, but the crew got a little seasick, uh, got a little uh, hungover from Christmas, so they had to postpone it a day. It was a two-year journey, supposed to be but it turned into a five-year journey. Can you think of any other five-year journeys like Star Trek here? Here's a map that shows their travels. Now, Darwin was a land lover. Now, I grew up in North Florida on boats my whole life, and I can tell you what happens when you take somebody out on the open ocean who's never been on a boat. They turn white, they turn whiter, they turn shades of green, and they start puking. They're seasick. Well. Darwin got seasick if there was waves out there. Luckily, the Atlantic is not always rough. There are times when it's nice and calm, so he didn't get seasick. It was a five-year journey. Darwin only spent 18 months on the boat. He got off every time he could. He actually spent almost three and a half years wandering around South America making collections. Now, at the very top, you can see Plymouth. Their very first stop was Cape Verde. On the Cape Verde Islands, these are volcanically active islands, and he got out and was walking around, and he made an observation. There were seashells, fossils of them, several hundred feet above the sea level. Now Darwin's sitting there going, huh, I wonder how these seashells got here. It must have taken a long time for him to get up there. So he starts thinking, the earth is old, the earth is changing all the time. Here's South America. This is where he spent the vast majority of his time. And what Darwin did is he went out and made collections. He collected insects. He collected fossils. He made bird and mammal specimens. And he shipped them back to England. And he was already becoming quite famous. But think about this. He's making collections. He's making observations. And he's starting to start ask questions. Why is there so much diversity here? Why is the diversity different than in other places? Why do I see fossils of extinct animals? that resemble today's animals. One day, he was in Chile, and he was hiking high up in the Andes, 12, 13,000 feet in elevation, and he came across seashells. That was pretty profound. You're in the middle of the mountain range, and you find seashells. You can do that here in Albuquerque. Go up to the top of the Sandias, and you can actually find fossilized seashells from 300 million years ago. Darwin started thinking, this world must be old. But what really hit him is when he got back down to the harbor, there had been an earthquake. And what happened was a mussel bed was elevated several feet out of the water. And Darwin was like, I got this. Hey, you take enough of these earthquakes over time, 
and you can put fossilized shells thousands of feet up in a mountain. So Darwin agreed with Lyell, the world is old. Now Darwin's journey is most famous for the Galapagos Islands, even though he did not spend the majority of his time here. The Galapagos Islands are off of Ecuador. They're west of it, a few hundred miles. And they're relatively young, volcanically active islands. And when Darwin gets there, he notices all these unique species that are different from the mainland. There's cormorants that can't fly. There's giant tortoises that he actually rode around on the top of them. And marine iguanas swimming in the water. Now that was very interesting to him. And of course, the Galapagos Island is famous for the Darwin finches. These finches all have different bill sizes because they're doing things like cracking seeds, eating cactus, or going after um, insects. But the Galapagos Islands are home to many unique animals, but here's the kicker. They're similar to animals in South America. So there's a Darwin finch. It's closely related to the finches in North America. These are this is a house finch. There's giant tortoises in the island. There are tortoises in South America. There are marine iguanas living on the Galapagos. There are tinosaurs, which is a type of iguana, literally living on the beaches in Central and South America. And of course, on the top is a flightless cormorant living on the Galapagos. This is a cormorant that actually lives here in North America. So there was a striking resemblance. This was a profound observation to Darwin because at the time, it was thought the Earth was young. And we listened to Aristotle who said, all species were created at some point in the past and they were all created perfect. And Darwin challenged that question. He goes, why? He said, no, if we created all the species in the past, why would we have different species on different islands? He found different species on all the different islands he went to. Why not just have the same species everywhere? Okay, his ideas of the world are starting to change. He's starting to realize, wait a second, what if finches landed on the Galapagos Island and changed? What if tortoises landed on the island and changed? What if these things changed over time to adapt to new environments? So Darwin gets back from the Beagle and he's made all these observations about species being different in different places and he's starting to realize the earth is old and species change. So his question is, why are species changing? So he starts coming up with this idea of natural selection. And one of the observations he made was, there are more individuals born than can survive. So this mass of ted tadpole eggs right there, there's way more, there's no way they all survive. And that goes back to Malthus. If they all survived, we'd be overrun by fruit flies within a year, but we're not. As Darwin made numerous collections, he would collect you know, many individuals of the same species. This is a crown anole from El Yunque. It's called Anolis cuviere. And as you can see, there is variation amongst these individuals. So what Darwin started realizing, wait a second, there's all these individuals that are born, but there's variation in a population. So he started realizing survival and reproduction are not random. He realized that the individuals that are best fit to the environment are more likely to reproduce and pass the genes on to the next generation. So here's how natural selection works. Here's a Katie did. Okay, that Katie did looks a lot like a leaf. And the more it looks like a leaf, the more likely it is to survive and the more likely it is to reproduce and then pass on those genes to the next generation. So any change in its genes that makes that Katie did look more like a dead leaf with a chewed edge or veins in it, then those mutations are kept because they are beneficial. So over time, these beneficial mutations are kept and they accumulate. And over time, species change by natural selection. And they change so they become better adapted to their environment. So Darwin had two major points. One, species today are descendants of ancestral species. Let me put that in a perspective for you. You are the end product of 3.8 billion years of evolutionary success. You represent that unbroken lineage going back to the dawn of life on this planet. 
So this is the evolution of whales. Whales are mammals. They evolved from an animal that lived on land that had four limbs. Over time, that animal, that species changed and slowly evolved into whales. And today, whales still maintain characteristics of mammals. Their front fins have the same bone structures we do. And they also are warm-blooded and they produce milk for their young. And they have live birth. Darwin's second point was natural selection is the mechanism of evolution. So this is evolution in a nutshell. I kind of like this little cartoon right here. These crows are eating the green beetles. That means that the green beetles are less likely to survive. The orange ones are more likely to survive. And what happens is they pass on their orange genes to the next generation. And over time, the beetles evolve to be orange. That's an example of evolution at a very, very small scale that might occur over periods of tens of years or hundreds of years. But don't forget, Darwin, by reading Lyell, realized that the earth was old. And because there was an old earth, millions of years old, it gave evolution plenty of time for species to change into a wide variety of different types. One of the things about evolution, like any good theory, it makes lots of predictions. One of those predictions is we should see transitional organisms. And what you're looking at here, this is Archaeopteryx. Today, we're almost fairly as certain as you can be that birds evolved from dinosaurs. Now, dinosaurs are large animals. They have teeth, they have bony tails, and some of them actually had feathers. This animal here clearly had feathers like a bird. It also had a feathered tail, but that tail was bony. Dinosaurs have a bony tail, birds do not. This animal also had teeth. Modern birds do not have teeth, dinosaurs do. So this organism right here, Archaeopteryx, had characteristics of both modern day birds and dinosaurs. So we say that Archaeopteryx is a transitional organism and it could clearly fly. Now, Archaeopteryx probably wouldn't do very well today because our birds are really good at flying. They've had 135 million years of evolution of learning how to fly. But hey, back in the day, these guys ruled the sky. Now, it is true that the fossil record is a little bit incomplete. Actually, it's a lot incomplete, but that's okay. We don't need a fossil of every species that ever lived, although that would be fantastic, or an example of every generation of every species that's ever lived, so we could see all the intermediates. And we actually don't see all the intermediates. And the reason why is because they're long gone. And think about gaming. When was the last time you saw a Commodore 64 or an Atari? I know that some of you probably have, but that's really only because they become the in thing or the popular thing to go find now. But the reality is, how many of you own an iPhone 1 or an iPhone 2? Those were only 10 years ago. And that technology is almost completely gone and replaced by i5s, i6s, i7s. And this fall, the i8 will come out. So phones are evolving quite rapidly and we don't see the first ones hardly at all anymore. Same with our gaming systems. Even though we don't have a fossil of every single species that's ever lived, that's okay. You see, the fossil record still supports evolution, and here's why. Evolution said, hey, species change over time. Well, the fossil record is laid down in layers. Oldest layers are on the bottom, youngest layers are on top. So we should see modern species like humans and dogs and elephants near the top. Then we would see dinosaurs in the middle, and we would see very primitive animals on the bottom. That is exactly what we see. You see, if Aristotle was right and species were all created at some point in the past, then we should go through the fossil record and see random distribution of species, meaning you could find a bunny rabbit next to a dinosaur. But we don't ever find that, never. We do see mammals next to dinosaurs because believe it or not, the very first mammals did evolve over 200 million years ago, but those are not modern mammals. So the fossil record clearly shows a progression and a change of animal life over the last 500 million years. So we don't see a jumble of fossils throughout the fossil record. We see a clear progression exactly as evolution predicts. Okay, this can be confusing for a lot of people. Evolution, fact 
and a theory. How is that possible? Okay, let me explain it here. Species change over time. That's a fact. We can observe this. We can measure it. We can test for it. This is a picture of Tiktaalik. This is the ancestor to all modern tetrapods. Tetrapods are animals with four limbs. And as you can see, this animal has paired limbs. It's got a front limbs and a pair of hind limbs. Here's modern birds, amphibians, mammals, and reptiles. We have all changed over time from that pre early organism. So species change over time, that's a fact. Remember, facts are things that we can observe, we can test for. Okay, here we go. The theory part, evolution by natural selection. The question is, why do species change over time? So evolutionary theory, evolution by natural selection, these are things that explain why species change over time. And to remind you, Newton's law of gravity, you drop your pen, it'll fall to the earth. You drop any object, and any object will fall to the earth at the same rate, 9.8 meters per second squared. Doesn't explain how gravity works. Einstein's general theory of relativity is a theory to explain how gravity works. Evolution by natural selection is a theory used to explain why species change over time. And remember one thing about theories, they are very well supported. Evolution by natural selection has been supported by over 150 years of experiments and observations, and it is yet to be refuted. So why was evolution so revolutionary for science? Well, it changed the way we do science forever. Evolution by natural selection did not rely on supernatural explanations to explain the origin of species. Darwin came up with a natural mechanism to explain both the unity of life and the diversity of life. So we don't have to worry about having a flying spaghetti monster as the designer of all life or anything like that. From that time when Darwin published his theory, it revolutionized science because all of a sudden we have modern science. And modern science begins with the observations and we ask questions and we go out and we test them and we use our data to refute our hypothesis. And we're talking about the natural world here, things that are potentially observable, measurable, and testable. So Darwin, by putting out his evolution by natural selection, that was the last time in science that people relied on some kind of supernatural explanations to explain the natural world. From that point on, science was forever changed.